This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. On Friday, September 27th, the Norris Group proudly presents its 12th annual award-winning black tie event, I Survived Real Estate. An incredible lineup of industry experts will join Bruce and Aaron Norris to discuss perplexing industry trends, head-scratching legislation, massive tech disruption, and opportunities emerging for real estate professionals. All proceeds from the event benefit Make-A-Wish and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. This event is not possible without the generous help of the following platinum partners. The San Diego Creative Real Estate Investors Association, Invest Club, Think Realty, Coach Fullerton, Property Radar, The Apartment Owners Association, MVT Productions, and Realty 411. Visit isurvivedrealestate.com for event information. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris. Today, our special guest is Robert Dietz. Robert is a PhD, is chief economist for the National Association of Home Builders, where his responsibilities include housing market analysis, forecasting and industry surveys, and housing policy research. Prior to joining NAHB in 2005, Robert worked as an economist for the Congressional Joint Committee on Taxation. He has testified before Congress on housing, economic, and tax issues. He's a leading expert on home construction analysis and trends. Robert, we welcome you to our show. Good to join you. The first thing I thought of, it was a heck of a time to join the National Builders Association. 2005, uh, builders were having the time of their life, and, uh, and then things changed quite a bit. So I, I'm just curious about the transition that you saw. The HMI index, for instance, was probably around 70 in 2005 and maybe explain the HMI index if you, if you don't mind. Yeah, I, uh, I joined the industry at an interesting time, although I've been doing housing and, and real estate analysis for uh, quite a while. The, the HMI is the NAHB Wells Fargo housing market index. It's our monthly single family builder confidence measure. And it's a zero to hundred scale. We go out and we, we survey builders, a lot of small builders, regional builders, uh, and uh, any score above a level of 50 uh, indicates the more of the builders in the survey view market conditions, which is a combination of demand side issues and supply side issues. Uh, they, they view those market conditions as, as positive. So yeah, if you're if you think about the early part of the last decade, kind of running into the Great Recession, uh, market confidence was uh, fairly positive. And then as that cycle began to age and it was clear that there was building out beyond, say, household formations, uh, builder confidence really dropped. And I think at the low point, it was at a level of eight, <laughs> uh, which is uh, yeah, really low. So that's what you're talking about there, the, the depths of the Great Recession. What's been interesting, sort of during my, my tenure at NHB, I've, I've got uh, about three and a half years in as the, the chief economist, and before that I spent uh, about 10 years doing industry analysis and, and a lot of the tax policy analysis, uh, was that uh, the, the cycle that we've had after the Great Recession has really been characterized, uh, particularly on the single-family side, by a significant amount of underbuilding. Uh, and a lot of that is due to not necessarily demand issues, although the problems with affordability and the ability to save for the down payment. But what's made this cycle different is that uh, builders have faced persistent labor shortages, and it's gotten a lot more difficult to access and develop land. That has, of course, then, uh, over a period of many years, contributed to a housing affordability crisis. And the something's got to give moment uh, essentially occurred last fall when mortgage interest rates hit 5%. Uh, rates have been going up, of course, because uh, of tax reform and uh, there was a good amount of economic momentum. But that housing affordability crunch that occurred in late 2018 
really did take the wind out of the sails of the housing market. And that's essentially what we're dealing with right now. We've got a little bit of a kind of a soft patch going. And uh, some of the data that we have for April and May indicates that lower mortgage interest rates, well below 4%. Maybe we've now turned the corner, at least in a kind of a local time period uh, consideration. You know, what's interesting about that is that I'll, I'll just speak to California's affordability rate. So we have a history of going, uh, bouncing, say, between 40% and 17%. And in 2018, when the interest rates got to, let's say, as high as they were going to get, we were at 28. And historically, when we go from 28 to 17, we have uh, like an off to the races mo- mo- uh, moment three or four years of extraordinary volume and price escalation as we go from 28 to 17 affordability. So I guess what I was, you know, what's, what's confusing to me is the affordability number 28 that we were at, let's say at our lowest, we didn't have our normal reaction, but yet it wasn't unaffordable. So on a national number, were we reaching historic lows at a 5% mortgage rate in 2018, or was there other contributors that made people just not want to buy? Well, so, I mean, the, the index that we do, the NHV has one called the Housing Opportunity Index, which is our, our affordability industry, or there's lots of these indices. Um, you know, for California markets, in our index, you know, we've got levels in, say, Los Angeles and San Francisco where only – Six, seven, eight percent of the combination of new and existing home sales are affordable for a family right in the middle of the income distribution. And those are incredibly low rates. Now, historically, you know, nationwide, we're, we're looking at last fall, we probably hit about a two decade low, or I'm sorry, one decade low on housing affordability considerations. But what made this different was that, uh, you know, if you talk to anyone who is familiar with mortgage interest rates, say in the 80s or the 70s, a 5% mortgage interest rate really doesn't sound that high. And it, it, it's, of course, not. But what's different is a combination of both the physical economics, the fact that there is a, a dearth of particularly resale inventory uh, at all levels of, cons- uh, of the housing market. And then you've got a combination of no resale, and low construction activity at the entry level. And it's that sort of missing low end that's really the the challenge. So if you're already a homeowner, it's pushed up home prices, and that's been good for the remodeling market the last few years, although we're seeing some softening in the remodeling market in 2019. Uh, but that, that lack of inventory is very frustrating, particularly for millennial home buyers who are finally, uh, say, over the last year or two, starting to see some acceleration in wage gains. They're, they've been out of school long enough that they're starting to save some money. But builders have just not been able to supply housing at that, that entry-level price point. So nationwide, we're, we're talking about you know new home prices uh, below, say, $250,000. And part of the reason for that, we'll kind of get back to California to wrap this up, is that uh, the, the regulatory costs associated with developing and acquiring land and then building the home, those, those costs have gone up a lot in this cycle. We, we did a study in 2011 and then repeated that study in 2016. And over that five-year period, regulatory burdens associated with lot development and home construction for single-family homes went up 29% over that five-year period. And nationwide, for the typical new single-family home, they add about $80,000 of various kinds of development costs. So when you've got regulatory burdens that are things like impact fees and design requirements and green space requirements, it becomes a death by a thousand cuts exercise. And how do you build, say, a $200,000 newly built single-family home when you've got $80,000 of various kinds of government rules that you've got to pay for and so it just becomes very difficult. Now, there are some, some markets where it can be done. Some of that is geographic, and some of that is structural, things like townhouses. You know, I was once a young married guy, <laughs> and I was, I was lucky enough that the builders in California were building predominantly entry-level homes. That was just the cycle. 
And you're right, they're not they're not able to do that now. They they buy a lot and they get a permit. They're at 150 grand in an area that's kind of rural. So, yeah. Th- so where where are these new buyers? I mean, I'm I'm thinking like a 20 year old now going, well, I can't buy here. So, where are they migrating to, or are they just deciding I'm never going to own? Yeah, you see this clearly in both the migration data in terms of where are people moving from as well as where some of the high growth rates in home construction are taking place. And quite frankly, they're they're moving not enough to reduce the population, but the, you're, you're losing potential population from markets like California, parts of Oregon and Washington, and they're moving east. So you see hot markets in places like Idaho, uh, Utah. Montana has done fairly well, although it's cooled off a little bit in 2019. Um, so they're, they're moving into these mountain states. And why? Well, uh, cost of doing business is a little bit lower. That's good for employers. It's easier to acquire land, and you can develop lots and communities faster, so that's good for housing supply. So when you have a combination of jobs and relatively more affordable housing, you're, you're going to get growth. Um, A good example, I I was in Spokane, Washington. I I, I visit a a different market effectively each week. Uh, But I was in Spokane, Washington back in March, and there's a market that's expanding. It's got good price growth uh, because they're benefiting from their relative uh, affordability uh, conditions with respect to housing compared to, say, Seattle and and Portland. So if you look at growth, it's right now it's in places where – uh, you know, the southern states where there's a lot of just momentum, this would be places like Florida, the Carolinas, increasingly parts of Georgia and Texas, sort of traditional places where you've got population from the northeast and the midwest that's moving there, combined with relatively wealthy baby boomers who are able to pay cash and buy homes. Um, and then those mountain states uh, where affordability really does trump some of the areas in the, in the west coast. So I think that's why right now housing affordability is is on the verge of becoming a presidential election campaign issue. Housing often struggles sometimes to kind of make its way among other big political issues that tend to be hot button issues that make cable news and are discussed on radio. But you're seeing a lot of presidential candidates right now talk about housing policy, land policy. And I think increasingly combined with a rising YIMBY movement, the the Yes in My Backyard movement, uh, we're going to see housing and housing affordability discussed going into uh, 2020. Just real quick, I met Robert uh, in Austin at that conference for the real estate editors, and I was asking him specifically in California because they have the chart of the regulatory costs, and I asked him if that included the cost of CEQA lawsuits as well as possibly the PR and communications piece. So when a builder goes into an area and is trying to get through a large project, those numbers aren't even calculated in that. So it's right. it's probably significantly, remember the CBIA, Ellen, who worked for that Tahone Ranch project. Yeah. That took over a decade, and they donated like 95% of the project to Land Conservancy. So when you can't get through a project in over a decade, I mean, wow. Yeah, I had a personal friend who had a, a very unusually large parcel of land that finally kind of butted up against population growth, and it went into escrow with a pretty good-sized builder who spent $10 million in 10 years and finally gave the land back to the guy. He could, never, he could never get it through. So. Yeah, you, you, you see that nationwide where it's just taking longer and longer to develop land. And, and there's a uh, Harvard economist that study housing markets, and he, he wrote a paper in 2014 and 2015. And uh, that research said that no single regulatory policy has as large an impact on the well-being of ordinary American households as our land use rules. And it's hard to measure because every every place has its own sort of hang-ups and, and different kinds of concerns. Uh, but without a doubt, it has an impact in terms of rental markets and the ability to afford an apartment. It has an impact on the ability to buy a home. And one of the numbers we've been watching this cycle that's been kind of disturbing is the fact that despite the fact that the unemployment rate is well below 4%, you've got some rebound in, in household formations. The share of young adults who now live with their parents has gone from, say, two decades ago, it was one in 10 young adults, 25 to 34-year-olds, to one in five. It has doubled, and it has doubled out of sync 
with the labor market cycle. Usually that kind of moves along with joblessness. People live at home during tough economic times, but instead it continues to rise. And some want to blame social factors or helicopter parenting or, you know, those kinds of discussions. But I think a lot of it really has to do with housing affordability. Well, you know, it's interesting. I don't know that I, I recognize an urgency to own something either. I mean, I got married really young at 17, but man, I mean, it was a, it was a top of my list to own a house. It really was. Had a little can in the kitchen, saved $20 whenever I could. It was a big deal. Well, we, we built a track of homes as a company in 2004 and five, and people were camping out overnight. This was sort of a remote location People were getting to buy them, of course, with nothing down. They were willing to buy a drive two and a half hours each way to work to get their name on a grant deed. There was urgency. I don't see urgency in the market that, oh gosh, I have got to own. That's just missing. Yeah, we, we've done some surveys of buyers and we found sort of this declining intent to purchase. I, I, think, I think lack of urgency or in some cases actual resignation. The fact that yeah. the housing affordability challenges have been there so long that for millennials, some young Gen Xers, and, and increasingly Gen Z, uh, you know, have basically said, you know, the, the ability for me to save a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars and be necessary to to put down a sizable down payment, it's just so beyond sort of my objectives, which also include, of course, trying to build up a 401k paying down my student loans, saving for a wedding, buying a new car, you know, the kind of usual list of kind of cash crunch items that uh, uh, young households have, that they just sort of accepted it. Now, that does mean that there is some change in preferences. And I, I think one of them at the margin is we're seeing some additional growth of single family built for rent. So the, the stock of rental single family homes has grown by about 5 million uh, nationwide. The vast majority of that are owner-occupied homes where the homeowners have moved and they're choosing to rent that out as their own household-level business. Uh, but there has been some growth in single-family built for rent. Uh, historically, that uh, market has been about 2.7% of single-family starts, so fairly small, a little less than three. Today, it's a little less than five. Um, so it's it gone up, and uh, we've seen, you know, it's, uh, tens of thousands of units that are being built uh, by builders for rental purposes. And I think the growth is going to be in places where you haven't necessarily seen that before. And that would include a lot of these West Coast markets that have affordability. So that's one way that builders in the market can provide a single family structure type. But ultimately, you know, when you go out and you survey people and their preferences, those millennials still want to become homo homeowners. About two thirds of them want to. It's certainly a great way to build wealth. It's just a challenge to be able to do it uh, in the near term. Yeah, what you just said is important. When you take a look at the net worth of somebody retiring with or without a home ownership, it's just a very big difference. Oh, yeah. The, the, the wealth of a typical homeowner is well above 200000 and the wealth of a typical renter, and this is control over age, uh, the wealth of a typical renter is below 10000 Yeah, it's scary. People do save in 401Ks and the, and the like, but uh, wealth associated with a home because of the way the amortizing mortgage works has just been a kind of American dream creator. Well, interesting about mortgage rates, there was a foreign country that uh, Aaron sent me an article on. Their new rate for a 10-year loan is minus a half. <laughs> yeah. So... I, I, I'm trying to get my arms around um, negative interest rates. I, I, I kind of thought we'd probably get there um, maybe in one of the T-bills, but I, it never occurred to me that you would actually borrow mortgage money at minus percent. I, I'm still having a hard time getting my brain wrapped around that one. Yeah, the, the economics of that are a little difficult to do. I, I, I can't speak to the finances of, of individual bank strategies on, on lending at negative rates. But, uh, but clearly, one of the, the big economic trends we're seeing is a lot of these European countries have 10-year uh, government bond rates that are, are negative. Yeah. And what's going on there is basically a flight to quality uh, combined with 
you know, once again, an echo of World War II. You can't overstate what impact that has had on sort of global economic conditions. But you've got the baby boomers, and they are the wealthiest generation. They're, they're seeking relatively riskless uh, assets, and so government debt is one of the ways to do that. Um, it's one of the reasons that the discussion about an inverted yield curve is a little more complicated than in past cycles, with, even within the U.S., because uh, some of that may be not just uh, domestic investors seeking out uh, kind of a riskless assets, uh, not necessarily act as a parking space, but less risky than equities. Uh, but you have a lot of international investors as well. So, you know, the the challenge, I think, in the U.S. housing market is the fact that we've gone from about a 5% 30-year fixed rate mortgage to today about a 3.6% rate on average. And there has not been this big takeoff in in home sales, nor did we expect one uh, looking back, say, six or seven or eight months ago. And the reason why is to benefit from those low rates. You still have to accumulate the down payment, and you still have to be making a decision where you're going to buy and hold a home over five years. And that has become increasingly difficult. You know, we have these interest rates, uh, and yet you look at the employment chart, it looks like we have full employment. And yet we got a 10-year T-bill this morning is a 1.5 something. So when you have a recession, you generally have the ammo to lower these rates four to five percentage points. Um, when we have a recession show up, we're not going to have that kind of ammo. So what kind of policies do you think will be implemented to help get out of the next recession? Yeah, I, this is this is kind of an interesting one because you know if we kind of take it back you know a year ago, it seemed like the Fed was very focused on raising the Fed funds rate, which they did four times for 100 basis points in, in 2018. They were trying to raise rates in order to have the ammo or the the, the room for maneuver in case a downturn came. But in so doing, by raising rates aggressively. They, you know, kind of weakened the overall situation of the macro economy and brought on the downturn, at least at a kind of a soft patch level that they were trying to fight. It's a very kind of bizarre strategy. They're clearly backing away from it. I'm, I'm, I, I guess economists maybe are, we sometimes are, are guilty of blackboard thinking, hypothetical thinking, but I'm less concerned about the, the kind of lack of ammo argument, mainly because I think what the Great Recession proved is that the Fed and central banks have other tools, including quantitative easing, that they can they can go and, and buy uh, the government debt and hold it on their balance sheet. I mean, that's one of the benefits you get of being the reserve currency and having that, that ability to uh, you know, regulate the, the monetary supply. So there's there's room to continue to have rates. There's room to engage in quantitative easing when it's required. I, I don't think we're there yet, by the way. And while we we have GDP growth slowing over the next 12 to 18 months uh, below 2% growth rates, we don't have a recession on our table. But we may have something that looks a little bit like a growth recession in the sense that the, the unemployment rate goes up a little bit and, and growth slows down. Uh, but uh, they have other tools, and then the other tool we, we can't forget is, is fiscal and regulatory policy. I think there's still room for this administration to continue to make regulatory improvements. One idea out there that I think is a, is a good one uh, that could help housing markets is the idea of, of tying some of the grant uh, funding that comes from HUD and, and other agencies at, at the federal level to uh, improvements made by state and local governments in terms of their land use rules and their zoning rules and how long a permit takes, you know, kind of really incentivizing improvement on the on the regulatory side. There's also fiscal policy. Now, we've, we've obviously had a big tax cut in the form of the 2017 tax reform bill, so I, I wouldn't necessarily be expecting some big uh, tax cut, but there could be some bipartisan agreement around something like uh, an infrastructure uh, financing bill. And given that interest rates on government debt are quite low, this would seem to be, from the economics point of view, a good time to do some kind of infrastructure financing. And of course, that could include things that would improve home construction, like offsetting permit fee reductions and, and making capital improvements. So 
I'm, I'm less concerned about the ability of uh, the government having enough arrows in the quiver to deal with a downturn and, and more concerned about some of the fundamentals that are causing the slowdown in the economy. And those would include things like tariffs and the ongoing labor shortage. Um, you think the tax deduction changed as hurt housing? The fact that, you know, you have a bigger deduction and you really, most people probably don't even deduct their interest at this point. We, we definitely expected a slowdown in home price growth. In other words, demand to be somewhat offset by moving to a regime now where you have basically uh, about 34 million households a year that benefited from the mortgage interest deduction. Uh, today, it's a little less than 15 million. So there's been a pretty significant drop and people were getting a direct benefit from the MID. Uh, you have the, the SALT cap. Uh, now there's a $10,000 limit on state and local taxes, including property taxes. What a lot of people don't talk about and that my team has done some, some pretty good modeling on is the fact that the tax reform bill uh, meant that uh, most people who used to pay AMT, and frankly a lot of people that had big SALT deductions, uh, sales tax, property tax, income tax, probably paid AMT. And when you got in the AMT system of the income tax, your SALT cap was actually zero because all your SALT deductions were wiped away. So about 95% of people who used to pay AMT no longer do so. So those changes, we think, on net were were good for housing. They were good for builders because all the big tax reductions, we we expected some transition effects, Boeing and, and home price growth. And what's interesting is if you look at, for example, single-family permit growth for the first half of 2019, you actually have single-family construction gains in states like Connecticut and New Jersey, which would have been states that you would have been concerned about the changes on the itemized deduction side for housing. Uh, But they've got growth, and it's at some of these other states uh, where you've got a a fallback. So I guess my my view on on tax is a little little contrary, and I, I tend to look at the the net benefits. I think overall they're they're positive. Uh, you certainly do see some weakness in high end condo markets. Those would be places where the the salt limitation would have an effect. Uh, but uh, you know we can't forget that protecting the the business interest deduction for builders, small and big build, big builders was a big win for the industry when uh, interest deductibility was capped for, for most other businesses. It was protected uh, for real estate and utilities. And then protection of the principal gain exclusion for owning a home, the 250000 to 500000 tax exclusion, uh, was also a big win. So we'll have, to, we'll have to sort through some of those tax changes. Again, I think most of the slowness that we see in the housing market is really due to affordability and really is about the fact that it's just so much harder to add housing supply to all the different housing markets nationwide. Well, Robert, we are out of time. I thank you very much. We've been speaking with Robert Dietz. He's the chief economist for the National Association of Home Builders. Robert, thanks so much for joining us today. Great to join you. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab. The Norris Group would like to thank its gold sponsors for supporting I Survived Real Estate, Coldwell Banker, In a Day Development, Inland Valley Association of Realtors, Keystone CPA, LA South RIA, Las Brisas Escrow, Michael Ryan and Associates, NorCal RIA, NSDREI, Orange County Real Estate Investors, Pacific Premier Bank, Pasadena Phoebe, Shenbaum Group, SJREI, Spinnaker Loans, South OC RIA, U Direct IRA Services, White House Catering, Wilson Investment Properties. See isurvivedrealestate.com for event information. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trustees, visit tngtrustees.com.